right, Cameron Dawson, CFA, Chief Investment Officer at New Edge Wealth. Cameron, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful, thank you. How are you guys? Oh, I mean, how could we be any better? You got a you got a ripping market and you got a dovish fed. So let's just get right to it and you know, party on, Wayne. That was uh, the, I love your the way you bring things in. I mean, what is going to disrupt this party, Cameron? Yeah, we, the phrase that came to mind or all day yesterday I was just quoting to myself Wayne's World because nice. truly it was a spark of party on. And really, is this moment of being able to have our cake and eat it too, which is that you can have a friendly Fed and yet still have growth that is strong and robust and supports things like risk assets in equities as well as within credit because we've seen credit spreads continue to tighten, equity valuations continue to go up, which is a function of the fact that growth expectations continue to rise. Now, in past times, higher growth expectations and higher inflation expectations, which we saw rise significantly yesterday as well, would have been bad news from the Fed. But Powell struck a very dovish tone yesterday. It was a tone of, hey, you know, we can continue to, to forecast the fact that we could cut rates or trim rates lower, even if growth is, is reaccelerating, even if inflation is above our target. And that's, of course, why markets looked at all of this and, and effectively, to quote the great Wayne's world, uh, went schwing. <laughs> I, I mean, so how do you come in here? Like, what what's the bears got to chew on here? Because this is really tough for the bears. Because it's been, you know, this market and it looked like, and I was a little bit nervous on those inflation data points from last week, a couple just ticks higher here. I'm like, does that make Powell, you know, a little more cautious? It doesn't look like he wants to be cautious here, though. And if you're a bear, how do you fight the Fed? Yeah, I think that to your point is fighting the Fed has never really worked. What's interesting is that the Fed, even though they have been much tighter than what markets have expected, there have been other bigger things that have driven markets. I don't think that we can get complacent on inflation. There are signs of things like gasoline prices, which have gone up significantly over the last month and a half. They're up about 12 percent. That does contribute to higher headline inflation. You're getting to the point now where you saw this massive decrease in gas prices over the second half of last year. That's one of the key things that drove this immaculate disinflation that the Fed has really uh, been celebrating. Uh, but that has since reversed. And so I think the question is, do easier financial conditions, do some of these signs of cyclical reacceleration result in higher inflation to the point where the Fed can't write off like they did yesterday, they said, oh, we're not worried about January and February inflation data. We think they're just exceptions. We think we're still on the path to this disinflation. Do we get more evidence that that's going to be further challenged? And that still remains to be seen. But I think that that's one of the areas that I wouldn't want to be complacent about, because if you don't get that support, then June certainly off the table. And then we're talking about much more like two rate cuts. It, it through the rest of the year. I think the, the important thing to remember is that we don't get another update to the SEP until June or the dot plot until June, which just means that until then, we'll be kind of oscillating around kind of these bets as to whether or not the Fed is thinking it needs to be slightly more hawkish. Well, but I mean, mean, go ahead. Go ahead, A.B. I was just going to say, you must have been watching pre-market prep yesterday because we did talk a lot about those gas prices and that being a potential inflation driver. Uh, if we do get inflation coming down and the Fed, you know, starts to cut like it's planning to three times later this year, what do you think the what sectors do you think are the winners? Is it the hot names just get hotter or is it the beaten down names you want to go in and start buying? Yeah, well, I think that. There's an important point there to acknowledge that we've seen such a huge re-rating in valuations that there is some aspect of an easier Fed reflected in current prices. If you look at tech stocks trading back up to 2021 peaks, even things like industrials trading at 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 uh, valuations that are well above their 2020 peaks or pre pre pandemic peaks, this would all suggest that there is some aspect of easy 
easier policy that is being contemplated or anticipated by markets. Now, I would say that the important point is that if the Fed continues to be easier to markets, it would support this idea of cyclicality continuing to rebound, which to your point, Aaron, would say, hey, I could look at the industrials, the materials, uh, some of these areas, even the banks that have lagged, because you're starting to see a cyclical recovery in, in the economy, which is important because we are seeing PMIs, we think, start to rebound. We think February was probably a head fake. And we're, the, we're as we move forward, we likely continue to see this rebound in cyclical activity, which in the short term would be supportive of those cyclical sectors uh, very much so. I mean, we did get the higher inflation data and that could persist. But if I mean, if you look at like the growth forecasts, you know, moving forward, they're higher. If you look at retail sales, they're higher. I mean, it's such a it's such a muted picture here. If, if you're still talking about increasing growth, I mean, should rate cuts even be on the table here? What's it going to take? Yeah, that that's the ultimate question, Joel. And and. I think that these two charts are probably the most underappreciated charts in the market and maybe some of the most important charts to watch over the next six to 12 months. What they show is consensus GDP forecasts for 2023 on the left side and 2024 on the right side. And what you can see is that 2022's weak markets were weak for a big reason is that you were cutting estimates so very much for growth. You were cutting estimates from 2% all the way down to 0.25% for 2023 growth over the course of 2022. No wonder markets were weak. No wonder risk assets like equities were weak. You had credit spreads widen out. But of course, that turned in 23. You started to raise estimates, not just for 23, but also for 2024. This has been a big underpinning as to why you can see risk assets do so well. The big question is now that you have reset expectations from 0.5% effectively in the summer of last year to 2.1% today for 2024 estimates, how much further up can you go? You have started to see economic surprises start to roll over. You've seen some retail sales data come in a little bit weaker. But if this rolls over, that would be the challenge for risk assets. The thing is, we're not seeing evidence of it yet, which just suggests that there still is this, this favorable growth backdrop. But I would watch these consensus forecasts very, very closely, because when they turn, it usually is coincident with a turn in sentiment and maybe a fraying and some risk appetite. Uh, you mentioned the mirth mobile here and the equity mm -hmm. market says the consumer is fine, but aren't we kind of getting some kid conflicting singles from, from the consumer? Yeah, the yeah, the the mirth mobile is certainly discretionary stocks outperforming staples. This is one of my favorite ratios, mostly on an equal weight basis. So you're trying to control for the outside impact of names like Tesla and Amazon. And what it shows you is that when discretionary is outperforming staples, it is typically coincident with rising forecasts for household consumption. And that's exactly what we have seen. Discretionary outperform staples, household consumption forecasts have gone up. But to your point, Joel, we have started to see some signs of a slowing in actual retail sales data. And that's where we could see an interesting divergence in the data. If retail sales continue to be squishy, will you continue to see consensus revise up forecasts for household consumption? Maybe not. So it, we don't have enough evidence of it yet, but it's something to watch. For now, the equity market says we're well in the mirth mobile. We don't have to worry about the consumer. But if this ratio turns, that's when we would get more concerned about forward expectations of declining growth. So respect this trend, respect that, that discretionary outperform staples, but watch it closely. Cameron, why? I mean, from like a macro perspective, I mean, we're talking about the market at all time highs. Retail sales are doing OK for now. I mean, you know, there might be some weakening there, as you pointed out. But why do you think so many people out there don't feel like we're in a good economy right now? Yeah, well, I think that there's there's a few things there. The first one is that we live in a world of second derivatives. We live in a world of rates of change, meaning that when inflation slows, financial markets love it. It means that inflation is a rate of change and the rate of change slowing does show that there is improvement on inflation. However, us as humans live in a world of levels, meaning that 
as inflation is slowing, prices are still going up. It still is hard when you see grocery prices. So when we look at this economy, what we've continuously seen really since middle of 2021 is a big divergence between hard data, so what people are actually doing, and soft data, sentiment, what they're telling us that they're doing. That divergence has persisted for some time and is likely to continue to persist as consumers are weighed down in their emotion by higher inflation and higher prices. However, in reality, they are continuing to spend a very similar story for businesses as well. I know that's what's been so fascinating is people like will say the economy's, you know, like people's feelings are saying one thing and then their wallets are saying another because they're still going out and spending. Um, but certainly, like you said, I mean, we're, we're, we're still dealing with those higher prices. We talked about uh, gas as well. Joel, you want to hop in here with a question? Yeah, just about uh, tech. Uh, she's a robo babe. Uh, the tech just keeps going, but there is some divergence in tech. Should we just stick with what got us here or try and pick up some of the scraps? Yeah, I, you know, there's an interesting underlying dynamic with tech, which is that overall the sector reads very strong, but it is almost entirely driven by the semis. No surprise, because we know what's going on within the semiconductor space. But if you look at tech hardware, which is primarily Apple, um, uh, that has been has been very weak. Software as well has been weak. You've seen some relative weakness in names, of course, like Adobe and other other software names. So semis are really holding the candle here for all of tech. If semis roll over, that could be a sign that some of this tech dominance could stall. But as of right now, tech is in a very distinct uptrend on both an absolute and a relative basis. We have seen tech sell off in short periods of time. It sells off back to trend. It holds its trend really well. So until we see a negative volatility, something that signals that we could have a trend change, deterioration in the in the relative performance, or a big down day that shows that there is a C change in this desire for technology as well as in semis, you know, respecting this trend is important. But I would say is that you have to be selective within tech, mostly and, and keep an eye on those relative performance trends, because there's a lot of broken charts within tech, despite the fact that the overall sector remains in such a strong uptrend. Cameron, can the rally continue in the mega cap AI trade like NVIDIA? And we know Microsoft has obviously been strong. Is valuation scare you here on some of these stocks? And I know you're not, you know, really usually talking specifics, but I mean, the AI trade, can this continue? Usually when you think that it's too late, it's still going to keep going, right? <laughs> and it's like, it's a, it's a, a, a great Walter Deemer quote, which is that, you know, that parabolic trends tend, or parabolic moves tend to last a lot longer than you expect. But when they end, they don't end by going sideways. They end by reversing straight down. Um, look, I'd say that, that, in a world where earnings estimates are moving so rapidly, something like NVIDIA, where you have upside surprises of 100 or upside revisions of 150%, 200% to earnings, valuations are less relevant. However, NVIDIA is really the, the uh, exception. If you look at a name like Microsoft, it's up a lot, but its earnings estimates for 2024 and 2025 are only up by 8% in the last year. Mm -hmm. Meaning for all of the talk of Copilot and all of the talk of AI, analysts have revised their estimates up, but by a mere 8%, which just means that it's been all valuation expansion. That becomes more of a challenge if the earnings don't materialize or if the liquidity market backdrop environment turns against the market in a way that valuations that are stretched become an issue. So it's a, it's one of those things where you say you have to respect the momentum. I, you know, I, I know I keep saying it, but in noting that if positioning is crowded, sentiments extended and valuations are elevated, those are risks, but they're more medium term risks because they aren't catalysts in and of themselves. And they are very poor timing tools. And that's where balancing those things, keeping them in the back of your mind, but also being very aware that momentum is strong and that there's still this clamoring uh, for people to get in. Cameron, we're all waiting for like the bad news to like rock the markets, you know, with interest rates and the regional banks. And we get the bad news with NYCB and 
market just shrugs it off once again here. Just a little talk uh, before we let you go here. Let's talk about what how the market's been reacting to these regional banking headlines. And uh, if you talk about, you know, a little bit of a lagging, boring sector, where's the AI in financials? But uh, let's talk about them right now. Uh, the banks, are they turning up? Yeah, I mean, certainly on a relative basis, uh, the chart looks uh, a heck of a lot better. You're seeing absolute performance uh, turn and be much stronger. And this is all despite those those weaker headlines. We have a few things going on within banks that are, are notable. Of course, we have the re-steepening of the yield curve, which tends to be supportive for banks and their net interest income. But we also have a re-livening of capital markets, IPO markets opening up, credit markets becoming more active as people are returning back to, uh, to being issuing more bonds. All of this is supportive of the idea that you're seeing a cyclical recovery in cyclical parts of the market. Really important to remember, banks are cyclical. And so the end result is that we are seeing some firming in this performance. And I do think that, that that's an indication of that cyclical reacceleration that's happening. Um, and I think the other thing to note is that despite all the NYCB troubles, you never saw bank CDS spreads, credit default swaps, um, uh, really blow out in any way. It was just sort of a shrug, which tells you that this market isn't concerned about contagion risk and sees that as more of a one-off for now. <laughs> uh, one of Cameron, I mean, one of the kind of, I guess, lagging sectors this year has been small caps. IWM had a great day yesterday, closing up about 2% on the Fed news. Uh, do you expect small caps to start heating up here? I think one of the most impressive things to start this year is how small caps have interacted with their 50 day moving average. Every time that there's been a bit of a sell off, they pull back to their 50 day and just bounce right back relative not so much. They're continuing to lag the market. You know, the thing about small caps to remember is that they are more levered. They have more exposure to floating rate debt. And they're only about 40 or 40% 40 of the of the small cap Russell 2000 is unprofitable. So they need a good economy and they need lower interest rates. So of course, yesterday, no wonder they rally. They get the lower interest rate right. signal from the Fed and they get the economy as the Fed rate uh, increases GDP estimates. The phrase I've been using for small caps is we're here for a good time, not for a long time. Eventually, this economy will slow down and or interest rates will remain sticky and high. And that could be a challenge for small caps that have that balance sheet and have that profitability backdrop. So I think you have to remain very selective within small caps. Clearly, there is a, a episodes of positioning chases as well as dominance and things like SMCI, which certainly helps small caps to begin the year. Uh, but I think that overall, you know, the small cap trend has improved. There is momentum behind it. But just be very, very aware that if economic growth were to weaken, a lot of these gains could be very quickly reversed, just like we've seen multiple times over the past couple of years. Well, we've been on the line with Cameron Dawson from New Edge. Cameron, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me.